young people have a really huge potential to make a difference, but they don't always have access to the tools that they need to be able to make that difference. So we're really trying to create the opportunities and the support and the platforms that young people need to be able to take action. My guest this week is Vary McCann. Vary is the founder of Youth STEM 2030 and in December 2021 was named a National Geographic Young Explorer. Vary has a passion for looking after our oceans and is part of the World Ocean Day Youth Advisory Council representing Scotland and she's also presented multiple short films for BBC Bite Size. Vary, welcome to STEM with Mr N. Hi Stuart, thanks so much for having me today. So let's start off by exploring what is Youth STEM 2030 and what do you do as the founder of this? Yeah, so at Youth STEM 2030, we're really empowering young people from around the world to use science, technology, engineering and maths or STEM to tackle our world's biggest challenges. You know, there are quite a lot of, of big challenges in our world right now, and those are sort of outlined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. And those are, if you're not familiar with them, 17 goals for the whole world to be able to work towards so that hopefully we can have a better future. Um, so all of our work at Youth STEM 2030 is really about empowering young people to use STEM to tackle those issues, whether it's climate change, poverty, inequalities, um, there's, there's many more. Because um, I think young people have a really huge potential to make a difference, but they don't always have access to the tools that they need to be able to make that difference. So we're really trying to create the opportunities and the support and the platforms that young people need to be able to take action uh, about the issues that they care about. Um, so Youth STEM 2030 is a social enterprise, so we work not for profit, which basically means that we're kind of like a business that's making the world a better place. Um, and in terms of what I do, uh, I'm the founder, as you said, which can mean quite different things on different days. Um, it's quite varied, but overall, uh, I lead our strategy. I get to work with lots of amazing young people as well as our incredible partners and really work towards making our work as impactful as it possibly can be so that we can empower as many young people as, as STEM change makers as we can. I also said in the introduction that you're a National Geographic Young Explorer. Can you tell us a bit about that programme and how you became involved in that? Yeah, so every year National Geographic selects around 25 young people from around the world who are leading change in all different ways, whether it's storytelling, science, uh, innovation or something else. Uh, but all, all of us are ultimately working towards a more sustainable planet. Um, so I was really, really shocked, uh, genuinely shocked and very grateful uh, last December when I found out that I was going to be one of the 2021 Young Explorers, um, especially because for the past few years I've sort of been following uh, the work of and kind of looking up to some of some of the other people who either were announced this year as Young Explorers or had been previous ones. So to be selected alongside them was like completely um, mind-blowing really um, but really being a National Geographic Young Explorer gives uh, our work at Youth STEM 2030 grant funding to do a brand new project called Youth STEM Change Makers so that's really going to enable young people who want to make a difference but haven't yet been able to to turn them into young people that can say I've made a difference to this issue that I care about through STEM um, so that's going to be launching very soon um, but yeah it's, very, it's been very very exciting to be able to work on that and especially alongside so many other incredible young people who are all doing so many incredible things in their various parts of the world. And in what area do you STEM 2030 operate and people can access these programmes in? So we're based in Scotland only because I am but we work globally so we've got young people from we've reached young people in around 82 countries around the world um, and we really don't have have a kind of border or um, or place it just happens that I live in Scotland but beyond that um, everyone is is all over the place uh, which can make it tricky sometimes time zones and uh, lots of virtual virtual working together but um, makes it an incredible community um, for young people to be part of. And it's very important as well because you were saying earlier that obviously your aim with STEM is to allow young people to be able to make changes in the world. So the fact that you've got no borders and you're tackling global problems, um, that will help the fact that you're not going, no, we only work in 
in this area. Is that something that you've had in your mind from the outset with the goals is we want to be borderless? Yeah, I think so. And I think that um, while in very most respects the pandemic was very much and has been a very much bad thing in, in most ways, it has also allowed us, the world has kind of shifted towards digital for those who do have the, the access to, to digital tools. So, um, but really from, from the outset, I wanted to make sure that this isn't just about young people in Scotland deciding what's best for the world, but actually it's about what are the issues in different parts of the world? How do they, those issues um, look in different parts of the world? And how does that fit in the global picture? If we're doing something that we think is going to be beneficial in you know one local area, but what impact is that having elsewhere in the world? Um, and also it means that there's this kind of international collaboration amongst young people, which certainly um, for me, I didn't, I didn't have the, the chance to, to kind of do growing up at all. Um, so I think that that can be really powerful. You know, we then see, for example, we had two young people, one in Canada and one in Peru, both saw the same issue of hostile architecture, which is where um, cities or towns are intentionally designed to mean that homeless people um, aren't able to, to access uh, fully. So for example, if you've ever seen that kind of annoying third armrest in the middle of a bench, that's an example of hostile architecture um, or on the ground where it's all spiky um, and you're like, why is that there? That's another example of hostile architecture. So they both saw that in their respective cities. They've never met each other in real life. I'm not even, I don't even think they've ever been to each other's countries, but they were both able to connect over that issue that looked very similar in, in both of uh, the towns that they lived in and then were able to write an article sharing that so that other young people can then learn about that issue. And I think that that's, that's a really powerful thing, being able to, to collaborate with so many incredibly young people wherever they are in the world. And it's brilliant that you're giving young people these opportunities to be able to do that. But you said you didn't have the same sort of opportunities when you were growing up and going through school. So I'm curious, what actually first got you interested in STEM? Yeah, so I think growing up, I had like a really big interest in like nature and animals, and I still do. Um, I spent a lot of time reading pretty much any book that I could find about nature, the world, animals, science. Um, so I think that played a big part in it. Um, in primary school, I don't really remember doing a lot of science. Like, I don't remember there being much chance to do um, STEM. And then when I went into high school, obviously you kind of get a wider um, access to new subjects and things like that. And some of it I really enjoyed. Like, I loved science and maths. I absolutely loathed computing, so you don't have to like all of STEM. Uh, I also hated anything to do with a computer, to be quite honest. So, yeah, you, you don't have to like it all. But I think that throughout growing up, I didn't really realise like the difference that like that I, that I could make at all um, and also didn't have that kind of chance to take STEM beyond the textbooks or the school curriculum into the kind of real world you know I sort of thought oh you've got to wait until you finish school and get a job and then maybe then you can you can make a difference um, but that sort of changed when I was 17 um, I had the opportunity to spend my summer holidays at the University of the West of Scotland doing what's called the Nuffield Research Placement. So I basically spent five weeks of my summer holiday that year doing a scientific research project, looking at the impact that uh, agrochemicals or pesticides have on marine invertebrates. So all these wee tiny animals that, that live on rocky shores, which is basically beaches with rocks, and the impact that these pesticides were actually having on their behaviour, even though they were being marketed as the more environmentally friendly ones. You know, I'd never done anything like that before. And it gave me so many new scientific skills and research um, experience and so many amazing things came out of it. But that actually wasn't like the biggest impact that it had for me, because the, the thing that it really um, made a difference for me with was that it changed what I thought was possible. Um, it made me realise that I could make a difference and that science actually isn't about the textbooks. It's not about memorising processes for an exam. It's actually about thinking outside the box, solving problems and failing quite a lot <laughs> along the way. Um, it's really about and I don't, I don't think you get to realise enough of that in school. Um, so if I could rewrite the whole education system, I would definitely put some of that into it. But that was what made me 
really into what I would then say now is, is, is science. Um, and that was that really, really changed what I thought science was. And you're obviously now quite a public face with what you're doing with STEM, with you STEM 2030 and the Nat Geo Young Explorer. How important is it for you to see more girls uh, being inspired and coming through in STEM? I think it's so important that all young people, you know, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, financial background, you know, whether they're disabled, LGBTQ+, to be able to see STEM as something that is for them and that they can pursue and that they can also bring their full selves to. Um, but in terms of like gender specifically, I think there's so many amazing women in STEM who are being visible role models for girls, um, though I will say often unpaid and unrecognised for, for that work. Um, and that work is super important, like it's so important. But in addition to that, we also need the systemic change, both within the STEM sector and in society as a whole, so that STEM can truly be inclusive of everyone. And I think that once we are able to have a more diverse and representative STEM sector, then we'll be able to create more effective and sustainable solutions to these global challenges that are very urgent. Did you have any inspirations as you were growing up in STEM or any people that you still have as inspirations just now? I think for me, like it's, it's probably cheesy as it sounds, it's actually all the amazing young people that I get to work with like every day at Youth STEM 2030. They're honestly doing so many amazing projects, like making a real difference. I mean, the youngest young people that we work with were seven and that's like to, to be making a difference when when you're seven to me is just unimaginable in terms of thinking back myself of, of what I was like when I was seven but um I think that there's there's a lot of kind of um of young people that are that are out there making a difference um you know it's not we often get a kind of bad rap in the, the press and the media and I'm not saying that any generation is perfect, but also there's a lot of young people out there doing good in the world. Um, and I think that they, they are, are kind of the people that I look up to um, as, as because I see them as, as being the leaders, um, not necessarily the, the people that are in formal positions of leadership, but those who are actually going and making change, um, making new ways of doing things, better ways of doing things, even if it's not, you know, what's what's considered the norm or, or what people expect uh, when you're a young person. I don't think there's an age limit on making change. And these young people are going to be the leaders of the future um, anyway, so it's great that you're getting them involved just now and getting them thinking about all these problems so that when they do end up in positions of power, they've got that whole backing and, and can make the change that we're looking to see. And as part of that, one of the changes you're looking at is what we can do to improve our oceans. As I said at the start, you've obviously got a real passion for our oceans. Can you tell everyone about the problems that our ocean is currently facing? Yeah, so, I mean, I think our ocean is in, is in trouble. I don't think there's any, <laughs> any good way of saying that as much as it sounds, it sounds really negative, but it is um, unfortunately reality. Um, you know, the burning of fossil fuels, unsustainable fishing, plastic pollution, those are just some of the human created threats that are facing and impacting our ocean and people. Um, and, that's, and that's the thing that's often forgotten, it's also impacting people because it's so important to us. Our ocean gives us energy, it gives us food. It's so important for things like transport, tourism, trade. And it's also got a big role to play in like our physical and mental health. And it's got such a important place in tackling climate change like we need healthy ocean to be able to tackle climate change and i think that you know it's kind of it's summed up well there's a, a kind of a, a statistic of the fact that it is literally like one of our planet's lungs like it provides every second breath we take so we literally need our ocean to survive and yet it is so underprotected. Um, you know, it covers 70% of the earth, but less than 3% of it is highly protected. So it is a big issue. Um, but I think that it would be wrong of me to say all that without also saying that we can all make a difference. Um, and I think that the probably the most powerful tool that we each have, especially for, for young people out there that are maybe watching this, it's your voice um, that is the most powerful tool I think that you have and 
when I say that, I really want to emphasize that there's no one way of making a difference. You know, there's lots of ways that you can share your voice. And it's not just about speaking on a stage, because I know that that's not for everyone. Um, you know, you could share your voice by writing to your local politician. Maybe you want to write a song or a rap to share your message. You know, maybe you want to get creative with like a poster or a video. There's so many ways that you can you can share your voice. And I think start with the people that are around you. You know, maybe you can tell your friends and family about what you've learned about ocean conservation and climate change. Maybe you've realised that your school canteen could produce less waste. Maybe you've realised that in your local area there's some some issues that maybe aren't being aren't being tackled. And I think that if everybody can can kind of have that influence on on the the circles that they're within, whether that's their school, community, family, like the more we need everybody to kind of be able to to tackle an issue this big um so whatever whatever you can do to be able to to do that is going to help push us in the right direction one of the ways you're using your voice is as part of the world ocean day youth advisory council so what is the youth advisory council for world ocean day and what does that involve you doing Sure, so um, World Ocean Day is celebrated every year on the 8th of June. It's partly a celebration of how amazing our ocean is, but also partly a driving call for action of how much we need to do to be able to protect it. And the Youth Advisory Council is an amazing group of 25 young people from around the world, um, from all corners of the world. Some of them live right on the coast like me, some of them are in landlocked countries. And have, we had a, a member of the, the group that that told us at our, our last meeting last month that it was their first ever time seeing the ocean a couple of weeks before that. So, you know, it, it's literally um, everybody in terms of geographies and uh, backgrounds, but um, it's an amazing group of, of young people who are all leading in their communities, nationally, internationally, in many cases, to be able to, to protect our ocean um, and really are promoting the message of, of World Ocean Day. So, yeah, as you said, I, I've been part of that for the past uh, two years and sadly just finished up my term um, a couple of weeks ago. But um, yeah, that's been uh, one way that uh, I've kind of been able to, to raise my voice and it's led to, to lots of other of other opportunities to be able to influence companies, to be able to uh, influence politicians and journalists to be able to to spread my voice and hopefully get get them to to take some action about it because those are the people who can make the biggest difference those who wield the power we can all make a difference but those people who have the power to make systemic difference are the ones that we at this stage really need to to be making the right decisions because it's it's our generation that are going to have to to live with it the most and you know ocean um and climate issues are already impacting people you know so we we need we need them to be taking the action and i believe you've been uh, quite involved in going out cleaning up the coast around about where you stay is coastal cleanups um becoming more of a push for people to do to help make a, a difference with what's going on with the ocean or was that just something that you were interested in yeah, so every every Saturday during 2020 and 2021, I went to my local beach um, to do a beach clean. And I think that, again, alone, they will they will never solve the problem, but it's part of solving the problem. Um, I realised how how diverse the litter was. Like I was not it never ceased to amaze me what I found on those beaches, whether it was toys, a kettle. Uh, I once found an entire bin, which was quite ironic given that I was there to, to pick up litter. Um, but I think that there's also there's also a kind of a ripple effect of that because, well, for much of that time it was, you know, lockdowns and that was kind of my da daily exercise of, of the lockdowns when we were, you know, back when we were only allowed out for once a day or whatever. Um, then seeing other people then to take notice and be like oh i'll maybe actually think about whether i take home my litter or not uh, i think that makes a difference but also it kind of i think when you think about how big the issues are sometimes it then becomes difficult to take action because you're like well how much difference does picking up this one bit of litter take when billions of tons of um litter goes into the oceans every year it's like, well, you can then see that difference on your local beach uh, if you have one. If not, 
then over 80% of litter that ends up in the ocean starts on land. So if you don't live anywhere near the beach or anywhere near the coast, picking up in your local area can, can help too. And I think there's kind of, um, there's there's kind of no one right or wrong or wrong way of doing it um and it's about finding what's what's the the way that you can you can make the biggest difference that you can um with with the resources that you have and you'd mentioned earlier about the sustainable de sustainable development goals which i believe was the basis for the short films that you did for bbc bite sides so can you give everyone an idea of what the sustainable development goals are and uh, what the the bite size films uh, focused on so the sustainable development goals they also kind of go by the nickname of the global goals if you've maybe heard of them before uh they are 17 um goals that really are a blueprint for a better world. Um, they cover a whole range of issues and take sustainability in like really quite a broad sense. It's not just about, oh, let's help planet Earth. The planet is part of it, but it's also about people. It's also about having like a prosperous economy. It's also about having a peaceful world and a world where partnerships like kind of underpin all of that. So it's really about creating a better world in, in the broadest sense. Um, and those are a global call to action. So uh, every country is like signed up to, to do to be able to work towards um, them and has been doing so since 2015 with the aim to achieve them by 2030. Um, can't predict the future or know the future, whether, whether we'll reach them by 2030. But I think that um, you know, it's, there's a lot of, of urgent issues there. So no matter what you, you care about, whether it is that you want to um, have a nice local area to live in, whether you want to um, have a world where um, there's kind of inclusion, whether you want to be able to take action to protect the oceans or whatever it is, there's going to be something in there that, that's going to be of interest to you and is going to, is going to fit with your interests. Um, so there's kind of that's the kind of overview of, of the SDGs. Um, and then in terms of the videos uh, that I created, so now on the BBC Bite Size website, you can find uh, it was myself and two others. Um, we each kind of filmed a video about one of the SDGs. Um, so we did a few each, and those are available um, for people to be able to access on the BBC Bite Size website. So we kind of uh, shared a bit about what those goals look like in Scotland, you know, um, and also what they look like in the world as a whole, um, and visited some amazing projects um, in different different parts of the country to be able to show those those goals in in kind of local format. Like, what do these actually look like? Because you know, when we see climate action, it's like, well, that is a global problem, but it does also there's a kind of um, a kind of catchphrase that kind of goes along with them of of like. Um, global issues, local solutions type thing, where it's about, it's also about what we can do locally to be able to contribute to this. Um, and I think that one of the most important things about them is that these 17 goals, they're not just 17 separate things, they're all interconnected. So if we better tackle, for example, zero hunger, which is one of the goals, then we're going to be able to have a positive impact on people's access to education. If we have a better um, like if we have more young people able to better access their education, then we're going to potentially tackle gender inequality where, you know, in some uh, places there's unequal access to education for boys and girls. We may also be able to um, then positively impact on climate action because if we've had more access to education, then hopefully climate education is an important part of that and then being able to take that action. So you can start to see that's like one tiny example of how those can all link together. Um, and I think that's something that's often missed about them, but is the most powerful uh, potential aspect of, of the sustainable development goals. So there's obviously quite a lot there for people to unpack. And what I'll do is I'll find links to those videos from Bite Size, and I'll put them in the description of this so that people can go and check them out and learn more about them and all the hard work that you and your two colleagues put into that. Vary, thank you very much for joining me today. Just to finish off, can you tell everybody where they can access USTEM 2030 and the information about it? Absolutely. So you can check out our website, which is www.youthstem2030.org. Uh, we're also on Twitter and Instagram at YouthSTEM2030 
And if you head over to LinkedIn and you just type in Youth STEM 2030, then you'll find us there as well.